Assalamu alaikum. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wa nashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa nashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam wa ba'd. Um, the, the, the topic for uh, tonight's discussion centers around a very nuanced moment in the Islamic tradition and it's a moment uh, or an experience I should say that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi had an experience which profoundly affected him as well as affected the, the believers with him. And this experience is briefly referred to in the Quran in just one ayah. And this experience is given a lot of elaborate details in the Hadith literature. And, and for anyone who doesn't know the Hadith literature, the Hadith literature is a reference to the to the uh, to, to the sayings or to the uh, um, um, to the events that are ascribed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So this experience is called Isra wal Mi'raj, al Isra wal Mi'raj, and it's two words. Uh, Isra means the journey at night, and Mi'raj. Mi'raj means the ascension. Yeah, it's a, uh, referencing a deeply uh, mis mystical experience and I'm mentioning both titles because you may come across if you read Islamic literature you might come across one title or the other and oftentimes you see both titles attached together or you might see one title when it's actually referencing um, you know two different experiences so anyway the experience let me talk about the experience to summarize the experience, is, is the summary of it is that the Prophet Muhammad was taken in one night from Mecca. And this is 14 centuries ago. There's no, there no Saudi airline or anything like that. The, the, the Prophet ﷺ was taken from Mecca to Jerusalem. And then from Jerusalem to the different levels of the, of the heavens. Now, was this event just a spiritual event? Was it an actual physical event? Did the Prophet actually physically go from Mecca to Jerusalem in one night and from Jerusalem to the heavens in one night? I mean, did that really happen? The early Muslims differed on that answer, on that question. And it's even said in, in the sources that the Prophet's own wife said to Aisha radiallahu anha, it is said that she herself understood this experience to have not been a physical experience, but to have been simply a spiritual experience, a ruh, just a spiritual experience. So, there are two hadiths, two reports in the hadith literature on this experience one they both have certain details that the others that the other don't, don't have and so in in this in, in this discussion i intend to combine elements of both hadiths in order to um, um to go and discuss inshallah so the the hadith that talks about this the one hadith in sahih bukhari that talks about this is a very, very long hadith. You can, it's probably the longest hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And one of the things that, that, that's mentioned in there, uh, it begins by saying that the, the Prophet's heart was taken out and it was returned on a golden tray. A tray containing Iman, containing faith, and that the Prophet's heart was washed 
I mean, this is what it says. Now, at this point, when this experience, and it doesn't matter to me for the moment whether this was a physical experience or a spiritual experience. At this point, it's worth remembering that Muhammad wasallam was already a prophet of God. He was already a prophet. And he was already receiving revelation, the Quranic revelation. And he's already in a deep communion or deep connection to God. So, why would these things need to happen to him in the first place? So, I think that we can answer this with an analogy of what we do with regards to prayer. Before prayer, what do we do? We wash, we make wudu, right? We make wudu. And the Prophet said, he says that wudu is the key to prayer. Al wudu miftah salat. Wudu is the key to prayer. So, a washing of sorts. Remember earlier I said that the hadith begins by saying that the Prophet's heart was washed. That's how it begins. So, a washing of sorts is necessary before an important endeavor. When you wake up in the morning, and you have to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you wake up at, say, 6.30 in the morning, what do you do? You take a shower, right? You take a shower. And what do you do before washing your hands? I mean, excuse me, before eating? You wash your hands. You take effort to remove impurities as much as you can. You know, some people that carry around hand sanitizer, like little small dollar bottle of, of hand sanitizer. So the first thing you do is you do what you can to remove physical impurities. So the hadith says that iman, that faith, you know, and iman you know, has to do with, with, with security. You know, um, being assured of something. So, Iman was presented to the Prophet's heart in a grand way, in a unique way, in a regal way. Because the Hadith says that that Iman that, that it says that, that the Prophet's heart was watching. It says placed on a on a golden um, ta- a golden container. So, so his heart is. Is, 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 uh, once again, his heart is then washed in order to prepare for an important encounter. So this is the first thing in the hadith. Perhaps it would have been better for me to have did like a, as a PowerPoint, you know, to, to, to show this whole thing. But the first thing that's mentioned is the as the, the Prophet's heart was clean, was washed. So the Prophet Muhammad... Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already been. He wasn't some, some reformed devil. Someone who needed reformation. The Prophet was already, Muhammad the man, was already a decent man. He was already, um, you know, someone who was seeking to, 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 uh, to connect to God and such. But now... Now, he is to go to a higher level. Maybe I should use the analogy um, of employment. You see, you have a job, and you're supposed to show up at a certain job a certain time, and you go, and you dress however you want to dress, but then they decide to promote you, that you're now the manager at your job. You now have a position at your job. So you may have more responsibilities and you have to maybe dress differently. You know, you have to look the part, so to speak. You have to be prepared, so to speak. So this is something that happened to the Prophet. That, that at, at the higher, at the, he's elevated. And at the higher station, at the higher level, he is prepared for his job. And what is his job? مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٌ 
This is his job. As being the, the messenger of God. As being the seal of the prophets. Meaning the last of the prophets to, go to, to benefit mankind. And at this job, at, at this moment, and I didn't mention this, but I'll mention it now, kind of skipping ahead in, in the hadith. It says that he met the various prophets. There are seven prophets that are mentioned. Or actually, there are seven, there are seven levels. And each level he meets a different prophet. He means a different prophet. And the first level, he means Adam. I'm not going to go through all the levels. But the first level, he meets Adam. Who's Adam? Adam, the father of mankind. And at the seventh level, he meets Abraham. Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Who is... The, in a sense, the the father of of monotheism, you know, Abraham means according to the Bible's uh, rendering, Bible's understanding, Abraham is a word that means father of many nations or father of all nations, depending on what translation of the Bible that you read. So, the Prophet Muhammad he meets the other prophets and. He's connected to them. He is seen as being connected to the previous prophets. And the previous prophets, to make a long story short, the previous prophets endorse his job. They endorse him for his job as being Rasulullah wa Khadim and They point to him, to his, to his mission and to his message in the physical world. So... Continuing on this incident, this account, whether you understand it is physical or spiritual, I'm not worried about that at the moment. But in this incident, according to the, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, he sees four rivers. Two of those rivers are in paradise. Two are in paradise. Or I should say, or identified as rivers in paradise, and two of them are visible on earth. And the hadith actually names the two rivers: the Nile River, you know, Nile River in Egypt. Actually, it's not just Egypt; it flows through the, pretty much m most of of uh, East Africa. The Nile River. And the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River is in Iraq. And what do you know about rivers? What do you know about history? You, one of the things you know is that civilizations spring forth around rivers because you need water to drink, you need water to cultivate your civilization. And the regions, are, this, the regions in which these rivers are located, they all eventually became Muslim. And that's important to mention because this incident that happened to the Prophet, this happened at a moment of time when the Prophet ﷺ was still facing persecution. This is in Mecca. This, this is the Mecca period, not in the Medina period. He's still facing persecution. So, this religion is not for the next world only. It is for here. It's for here in this life. It's for here in this world. Obedience to the divine ethos makes for an easier life here. And what does the Quran tell us? That Brother Imam Rahim likes to recite all the time. You don't think I don't pay attention to these things. What does the Quran say? It tells us to make a prayer. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa billa khada hasana wa qina azabana. That's what it tells us to pray. Our Lord, bestow upon us that which is pleasant in this life. And bestow upon us that which is pleasant in the next life as well. And protect us from the fire of hell, or from the punishment of hell. So for those who understand this, 
the world does not become their masters. Rather, they become the masters of the world. And, and I know this part is perhaps a controversial statement, but for those who understand this, they don't have to worry about issues of heaven or hell. They don't have to worry about issues of heaven or hell. They, when they have this understanding in a deep and profound way, not only will they not worry about issues of heaven or hell, they will already be confident that heaven belongs to them. وَلَا خَوْفَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ Says Allah. They shall have no fear, no grief. وَلَا خَوْفَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ فَلَا خَوْفَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ Mentioned different ways in different ayat. So, this statement, this assumption, is not arrogance. It's just a simple fact. And this fact does not generate arrogance, but rather it will generate gratitude. It generates humility. It generates humbleness. And this will in fact Inshallah, this will in fact remove arrogance, if there's any arrogance there. And, and Prophet Muhammad preached, and Jesus preached before him as well, about the importance of not even having an atom's weight, A-T-O-M, not even an atom's weight of arrogance in one's heart. So this hadith goes on to say, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was offered a container. One container had wine. One container had honey. One container had milk. And before anyone asks me, the wine of heaven is not like the wine you get at the gas station. Before anyone asks me, so don't go thinking that it's now halal, the good, the wine at the gas station. Okay, because that is, this, that's haram. Because the wine of heaven does not make you intoxicated. This is all figurative language given in the Quran and given in the Hadith to describe the luxuries of paradise. So in any case, the Prophet is given three choices. And... He chooses, what does he choose? He chooses milk. He was offered wine or honey or milk, and the Prophet chooses milk. This is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet chooses milk. And arguably, milk is the most natural of beverages. So, he picks milk. And, and I didn't mention this, but he is taken around, you know, in these, uh, in these abodes, he's taken by a guy who's actually the angel Gabriel, Gabriel. And so, when, when the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, when he sees that the Prophet, when he sees that the Prophet chooses milk, he says, he made, he made this remark, he says, he says that this it is symbolic of the fitra which you and your followers are upon. And fitra, another meaning, uh, a meaning of fitra is the instinctual love for that which is good. Meaning this is primordial. The cleansed mind and the cleansed heart of the Prophet ﷺ recognizes the healthiest of choices. And this translates into being the same way practically in life. So we're also told in the Hadith literature, when the Prophet had two choices, that he would always take the easiest of the choices. Whatever was the easiest choice, he would take that choice. And... He was a person who taught moderation 
And it wasn't a, it wasn't a rhetorical statement the way we talk about moderation. Rather, it was he was very practical in these regards. And the example that I'm going to share, because there are many examples in the, in the in the in the literature that tells us about the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The most practical example is that he encounters people who are more holy than him. Yeah. People who think they're more holy than the Prophet. Or they think that they're more pious than the Prophet. They have more dedication to God than the Prophet. He encounters these people. And someone says that this someone says, I'm going to fast all the time. I'm sure we've heard this hadith before. I'm going to fast all the time. And another one person says, no, no, no. I got one better. He says, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna involve myself with women, meaning I'm never gonna ma- get married. I had no interest in that. Because it distracts us from God. This this is this is how this is this is you know the, the things that, that the the uh the thinking of people who encounter the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And so the Prophet remarked, he says, Well, you know, I fast, but I break my fast. You know, he doesn't go off and and um, just starve himself. He fasts, and then he breaks his fast. And he says, and I marry women. That's what he says. I marry women. And so, the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Muhammad, who had this experience about the Isra with the Araj, the Prophet was as is described in the in the in the seerah. He is described as Muhammad Muyasira. He is described as a teacher who makes things easy. Muhammad Muyasira. A teacher who makes things easy. So our Prophet I shouldn't say our Prophet, because he's a prophet of Allah. I shouldn't say our Prophet, so I should correct myself. The Prophet of Allah. The Prophet of Allah was a balanced man with a balanced deen. So, let me return to the hadith. It says that God had ordered the Prophet to offer, or to, uh, the Prophet's followers, the Prophet and the Prophet's followers, to, to pray 50 times a day. And it goes on to say, and I'm summarizing it. It goes on to say that Moses, because you see, he met Moses in this in this uh, experience. This Roman Arraj, he met Moses, Musa alayhi salam. He meets Moses, and Moses advises him and says, "You know, this is too hard. You got to go back and ask God to reduce the number of prayers, because you know your people are not going to be able to do that 50 times a day." And, you know, this part of the hadith, I must confess, this part of the hadith is difficult to comprehend. This part of the hadith. And even some Muslims ridicule this part of the hadith. If you, if you were to read uh, certain literature, read certain writers, even Muslims ridicule this part of the hadith. And so, I think that any difficulty about this hadith, it, be, it, it becomes removed when one looks at that thing which is called Judaism. It, even if you look at Judaism in the time of Jesus, according to the Bible even. See, Judaism, that, you know, put that term in quotation marks, Judaism had and still continues to have, modern Judaism, has perhaps countless ritual rules and ritual obligations, making the life of the practitioner of Judaism very, very difficult. And much of these uh, difficulties, much of these obligations are self-imposed. They stem more from, from the Talmud, from tradition, rather than just from Torah. This stems more from the Talmud. So, this entire narration is spiritual. It's figurative in nature. Particularly the part of Moses, alayhi salam. 
and asking the, the uh, uh, um, advising the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, advising that the prayers be uh, reduced. It shows us that the followers of Muhammad wasalam, are supposed to be in regular contact with Allah while not being so overtaxed that they no longer find it useful or find it appealing. So, five daily prayers, frankly, are perfect. It creates, I'm going to tell you why it's perfect. Because it creates a schedule of discipline. Yusuf and I were just at a program and, and um, you know, that was one of the issues of discipline came up. If we can pray five daily prayers on time, because you know you're supposed to pray on time. You know, salat al kana ta'ala mu'minin kitab min al-qutam. If we can say the five daily prayers on time, we can discipline ourselves to study. We can discipline ourselves in study, discipline ourselves in work, discipline ourselves in school. If we can fast in Ramadan, we can train ourselves to give up alcohol, we can train ourselves to give up cigarettes. We can give up, train ourselves to give up drugs. We can even train ourselves with regards to <coughs> our diet. We can even train ourselves with regards to that. Can we not see in this narration a narration of truth and a narration of light? A narration of balance, a teaching of balance. This is Islam. So, this incident is an indicator of things to come for the followers of the Prophet. And remember the Prophet. The Prophet was a normal man. Peace and blessings of God be upon him. The Prophet was a normal man. He was uneducated. He lived normally. Nonetheless, he was elevated in stature by Allah. And serves as an object of mercy unto all nations. He serves as a Rasul or as a messenger to all humanity. This is what, the, what Allah tells him to say. So the message that Allah gives him. That is, that, is, that is expressed in the best way in the Qur'an itself. The message that Allah gives him is a great message. It has universal appeal and it has global application. So, you can argue that we're talking about a new people. Well, we're also talking about a new globe. We're talking about a new globe. As we mentioned earlier, this incident the is the Mi'raj, Isra wa Mi'raj. Remember that the Prophet at this point was still living in Mecca. He was still persecuted. But this experience shows him what his followers will create. That his that his followers will create glimpses of paradise here in this world. And he mentions the Nile and mentions Euphrates River. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. And unfortunately, we may not have, we can't look at it now, but we have to look at it in history from the perspective of history. I mean, look at look at Baghdad. Look at the look at the history. The, even if we just Google it, look at the history of Baghdad. Look at the look at the civilization that came from that area. Look at Egypt. For that matter, Egypt after they after they accepted the Prophet's message, after they accepted Islam, these places became centers of learning in all fields, at least during the early centuries. And so, rivers benefited all, regardless of the particular religions, or, or, or the particular religions of, of certain peoples, particular viewpoints of certain peoples. It's just like the sun. The sun shines on the atheist as well as the believer alike. The, the atheist and the believer alike all breathe oxygen, breathe air. 
They all benefit from, from the same source, from, from, from God, from what God has given. So, if we were to study the history, and I'm not intending to go into history, but if we were to study the history, we'll be able to see that human civilization was indeed enriched. So now, I want to go to some practical things. Can we, today, have this experience or, have, or feel the benefits of this experience? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازٍ فَوْزٍ عَظِيمٍ Doesn't he say that? He says that those who give the obedience to Allah and obedience to, the mess, to his messenger, وَمَنْ يَتَعِ 